Please consider supporting Black Women United, YEG, for the protection and advancement of black women and girls in Alberta. You can learn more about them at bwunited.ca. Uh, they are always looking for donations and volunteers. So please, again, support Black Women United, YEG, for the protection and advancement of black women and girls in Alberta. Again, that website is bwunited.ca. Hey, this is Nicole calling from Hamilton, and I needed to let everyone know that I really proudly support Vish and Creative Control. I have for many years, I will for many more, as long as he keeps delivering these amazing interview podcasts. When you hear one of Vish's interviews, you think he's known this guest for years, they're good friends, uh, but the truth is he approaches every interview, whether it's sort of up and coming indie artists or established icons or like famous intimidating comedians with uh, a really deep, genuine curiosity, so he's never met this person, and the same really warm uh, candor, as so he's known them forever. I think it really lends to a great chat, no matter who he's talking to, and for that reason, I think you should throw Vish, like what, a dollar a month? He's got jokes. The jokes make it worth it. Support Creative Control on Patreon. To make your flexible monthly donation to Creative Control, please visit patreon.com slash creative control today. I'm Visha's wife, and remember, when you name a dog Janet or Timothy, you are dragging humanity down just a little bit. Sorab Habibian and Michael Jaworski are talented multi-instrumentalist singers and lyricists who are each based in New York City. Previously and respectively members of bands like the Obits and the Cops, among others, Habibian and Jaworski began collaborating together in 2015 when they formed the wonderful and prolific band Savak. Their sixth album is called Flavors of Paradise and was jointly released by Peculiar Works and Ernest Jennings Recording Company on March 1st, 2024. To celebrate the occasion, Sorab and Michael joined me for a fun discussion about things like the rock band The Who and Dancing Seahorses, adventures in snow shoveling, the late Rick Froberg's role in influencing aspects of Savak and his constant presence in our lives to this day, U.S. politics and what the media is doing to us, very specific and key years that are mentioned in a new song, why You Shouldn't Succumb to Pressure to Change Your Band Name, Gallows Humor and Punk-Infused Pop Music, Many Project Updates, Tour News, Other Future Plans, and much more. A part of the Entertainment One Network with the support of listeners like you who follow and subscribe to this donor-driven podcast and spread the word about it, and make flexible monthly donations at patreon.com slash Control, which is the primary and most reliable way for podcasters like me to make a living. In fact, as I'm speaking to you, it is my only source of consistent and viable income. So if you listen to the show regularly or you've never heard the show at all, but you have the means to support someone like me, please visit my Patreon today. Thank you so much. Plus, in-kind support from independent businesses like Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee, respectively, in Guelph, Ontario, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton, Ontario, this is episode 848 of Creative Control, featuring the lovely and talented Sorab and Michael from Savak, with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Hello, Savak. Are you there? Hey, Vish. Hey, Vish. We are here. <laughs> Thanks for having I, us. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's nice to have you on the show. Uh, Saurabh, how are you? I'm great. I'm really, really well. I just had some lunch. My huh. dad poured me a beer. Oh. It's all pretty good. <laughs> Is that, there you go. Are you, 
Are you working from home? Should you be having the beer at uh, this hour? <laughs> I'm, I'm visiting my dad, and uh, he said, you were doing the interview. Maybe you would like to have a beer. Oh, said, okay. That uh, loosens you up. Yeah, this is good. He's. Uh, I, I didn't ask him to do this, by the way. I'm like, can you loosen him up a little? Uh, yeah. He knows it's a pretty high-pressure environment with you. you know? <laughs> so you might as well have some serum of some kind to get the truth out of you. Yeah. Where, where are you, though, actually, so uh, I'm in Old Town, Alexandria, Virginia, which is where my dad lives. Oh, so, nice. That's yeah. lovely. How are things there, genuinely? Uh, good, 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 good. Just uh, sort of helping him clean up some stuff and trying to get him to move to New York City, actually. So help, helping kind of pare down a bunch of stuff that has been collected over the years. Oh, are you still in Brooklyn these days? Yeah. Yeah, okay. actually, same place uh, when we last spoke uh, okay. in Park Slope. Okay, yep. nice. Good. Well, it's nice to have you back on the show. It's been too long. Thank you for making time for me. And uh, Michael, I see you there. How are you? I'm doing well, Vish. Nice to have you Thank on you. the show for the first yeah. time. Sorry for my for cloudy, the first time, yeah. cloudy memory before we uh, started rolling there. Uh, I can That's be a bit, of, right. a bit of an ass, but I feel like I know you from your work, <laughs> I suppose. Uh, where in the world are you? Uh, I'm in Manhattan right now oh, nice. in my apartment. Nice, nice, nice. I just cleaned sparkling now <laughs> you know by the way this this episode was all arranged to make sure you guys cleaned up your places that's a, that's all it is it's just a catch yeah. how you guys is everything good where you live or where you're staying is it clean that's why i'm i'm here my wife thanks you in advance <laughs> i'm like we gotta tidy up for vish you know for the, for the zoom i'll be honest it's a little dusty where i am oh, okay well. <laughs> I've, I've been uh, a lot of a lot of spraying the uh mrs myers with uh with a follow-up rag around here <laughs> Okay, well, I won't keep you too long. You got some chores to do, I see, but uh, <laughs> it's nice to have you both on the show and to talk about this uh, great new record, uh, Flavors of Paradise. I thought we would actually begin uh, by uh, catching some people up about uh, the origins of this band, uh, because, uh, I don't know, sorry, when were you on? I don't know, it must have been like six years ago or some, seven years ago. When was it? I think the first record came out, was it 2016, Jaws? Yeah, 2016. Yeah. Well, actually, you know what, Vish? I have, sadly, a, a memory of our conversation that has been haunting me since that time, which is it was right before the election. Mm. And I was very cavalier about the fact that there was no way Trump was going to win. Ah. Oh, wow. Boy, was I wrong. Mm. <laughs> you were. You were, in fact, quite wrong. Uh, but and how uh, the yeah. world has changed since. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I actually, I literally, I occasion will think like, oh man, that last time I talked to Vish, I somehow thought, yeah, and I was really seriously cavalier about it. Like, you weren't like, the oh, only one, just... Rob. There were so many people who <laughs> felt that way. Yeah. You know, I remember yeah. during the vote uh, count or whatever, I could tell something was awry watching your cable news networks, your American cable news networks. So I went on Facebook or something, and I said, oh, he's going to win, and people were so mad at me. That uh, I was, I was basing it on whoever, what a Kornacki, whoever was yelling about the incoming <laughs> results. I'm like, no, I think he's going to yeah. win now, and people are upset and disbelief, just like you. Uh, and that was the yeah. night of, and then he won. So, and we, uh, you know, we all got the, we get the leaders we deserve. Maybe at this point, I don't know what to say. Uh, you know, here in, <sighs> we got some problems yeah. here in Canada too, and it's not going well. Yeah. We copy you guys. And so all the all the all right. Haven't you guys I thought you guys are smarter than us? We are vaguely maybe. Well, yes. There's no disputing the fact that Canadians are smarter than Americans. Like I can go on the exactly. I'll I'll, I'll throw that out there. But we're not better, uh, actually. Okay. And uh, all of our alt right uh, politicians just copying you guys left and right. But it's like a it's like a, a high school play version of what you guys do. Like you've got the full off Broadway play. You know, all the characters are fully developed, and it's all a bunch of bullshit. And we have like, you're not really thinking this through, you know, this is your soul you're selling and you, you're half into it. I can kind of tell, you know? <laughs> so anyway, sorry, that's enough about Canada. You know, I was intrigued by one of your uh, songs on the new album and I feel like, let me just see whose it is. Uh, just the joke uh, title, Will Get Fooled Again, made me <laughs> laugh because I like the who and they have a song called Won't Get Fooled Again. I don't imagine this has anything to do with elections or anything necessarily that's not my sense of things michael would you like to say something about this particular song certainly yeah it doesn't it's it is not a, a overtly political song i suppose uh it is more based on relationships and but this the title definitely was influenced by the who of course <laughs> and i remember actually the song title came to me many years ago and i was just like going for a walk in brooklyn when i used to live there and i think i just heard the song in like a store or whatever and i was like 
man, like won't get fooled again. Like how cocky of someone to think that, you know, I mean, of course it's like Roger Daltrey and the who, I mean, they were, you know, one of the best bands ever, but I'm like, you know, I just can't get behind that. It's like, we're humans. We, we all make mistakes. We all get fooled again over and over again. And yeah. so, well, the first verse seems very interpersonal, but the second, uh, by the second, I'm like, oh, this feels a little more universal, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it has a bit of both, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And uh, I do, at the end of the song, sort of uh, invoke the the mating of a seahorse, which uh, is a very interesting mating process where the I believe they dance for each other and um, in order to find their mates. And when they find their mate, they, they actually do partner for life. And another interesting fact about seahorses is that the males in that species are the ones who reproduce, too. So. Huh. I just thought like, what a wonderful, like, you know, juxtaposition to what our human lives are like. And, yeah. you know, so. Also, I just want to throw in that since people are listening to this, they can't see it. Jaws is actually a seahorse. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was actually going to say up until that last point, uh, I, I found that my wife and I could relate a lot to seahorses, except for the male reproduction <laughs> thing. Because we danced. Yeah. That's how I think we really started to like, if something's going on here. We were dancing. And then that yeah. uh, that's what loosened things up and whatever we uh, we started to be like yeah hey, something here so I, I didn't realize I had so much in common with the seahorse thank you Michael for this song now of I, course there is actually yeah. something there is something amazing about particularly you know I don't know uh, thinking about like junior high dances and how awkward you are with your own body and it's the first time you're close to another body like that yeah. and uh, it really you realize there's a there's something about that that physical connection that you're sort of forced to confront that's pretty incredible. Yeah. I had a friend when I was in high school and he told me when I was in this very situation, had a high school dance to go to. And he's like, Jaws, always dance with the girl. It'll always work out if you dance with the girl. And, you know, I have to say it's not bad advice. <laughs> Do you think it's a coincidence that uh, one of the most famous uh, high school dances from the film Back to the Future is called the Enchantment Under the Sea Dance? <laughs> is that is an that, inspiration? Is that an song? actual fact? Now is you're true? digging deep. Um, yeah, that's what Back to the Future, that's what the the key scene, you know, where you have Marty's, that information in your head. <laughs> well, I've seen the movie. I, I'm not saying that I own the trilogy on a DVD <laughs> or Blu-ray, but I or that, you know, my family and I just watched it. The whole trilogy. We have family movie night here. So every Friday we pick movies and uh, we start we watch the whole trilogy over a couple of weeks. I'm not saying all those things. Uh, I mean, yeah, that movie had an, left an indelible mark on me. It was a big movie. You, did you ever see that movie? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Yep. But yep. not not recently. Well, I'm just saying, you said seahorses dancing. I thought of yeah. Enchantment in the Sea. That's I don't know actually, where things that's are. That's amazing. Yeah. 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 I, this this is why cool. I get paid the minimal dollars. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. Now, I, I'm sorry. I leapt ahead into this new album. By the way, uh, I'll try to take this out, everyone, but there's a st I live in the land of snowblowers. Can you guys hear that? Oh. No. No. Okay. All right. Maybe no one can hear it, and I'm being paranoid. But I purposely you shovel snow over there. Well, I purp. No, don't say that. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I purposely shovel uh, everyone's sidewalk around my house when I know I have an. In oh, I do it all the time. Anyway, we have some elderly people around us, but I purposely shovel all the snow in my entire neighborhood, basically around my house, like four or five houses deep. People don't do that here, and I do it because I don't want the snowblower guy to interrupt my interviews. You see what I'm saying? So it a, seem, yeah, sure. So it seems it's not like, purely benevolent, but yeah, right. <laughs> I don't mind the physical labor. I like the little bit of exercise that it provides, and I like helping. We have some elderly people around us, so I like Josh helping. Josh had them. a snow shoveling incident a couple of years ago. What happened? Okay, yeah. So I live in a, I live in a uh, co-op building in Manhattan, and we don't have a super or anything, so we kind of manage ourselves. I happen to be the president of the co-op, which confirms my masochistic personality. But um, <laughs> there, there was, uh, yeah, my wife would definitely agree with that. There was a big snow and you know, there's nobody to shovel. And it's sort of like all hands on deck, but nobody in the building shovels inevitably. No that hands means on deck. It's, there's no hands on deck. <laughs> yeah. And so I think my wife and daughter had gone to like Central Park to go sledding or something like that. I'm like, I'm going to shovel the, the sidewalk so it doesn't turn into ice. So it's not treacherous. So yeah. we don't get a fine by New York City, blah, blah, blah. And I was out there shoveling. It was actually probably one of the last like big snows we've had in New York City. And then after like an hour or so of doing it, it took, it took that long too. I was like, I don't feel so well. And then I went down that sort of, uh, like, uh, -oh. uh to age to I'm at that point, you know, I, I was just over 50 years old. I'm like, started all of these, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, warnings of, uh, men over 50 shoveling snow. And I got worried and I, 
I came down with what's called TMJ, which is yep. too much Jaws. TMJ, too much Jaws. That's actually I not. Think, a, I don't think that's the actual full. Title. It's not. No, but <laughs> so too much Jaws. What what that is is I got inside my own head and I ended up walking myself over to the Presbyterian emergency room. Huh. And then like an hour later, I'm sitting there with all these like things stuck all over my body to make sure I didn't have a heart attack. Turns out it was just too much Jaws and not a heart attack, thankfully. But. I was worried. If only you had gone to the Baptist emergency room, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so wait a yeah. minute. Too much Jaws, uh, which is your version of the acronym TMJ. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, neuroses of some yeah, kind? Yeah, basically. That's what Hypochondria? I'm Hypochondria? Okay. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it's it's valid. I mean, I don't know. They, they It's weird that they fear. Why are they scaring the men from shoveling? I think it's some sort of ploy by <laughs> other men to be like, guys. We don't have to shovel. Don't have to do this. <laughs> we'll just tell them we'll have a heart attack if we shovel, and we'll pay some nerdy kid to do it instead. You can do this, guys. And that I that seems more plausible. Yeah. So I went and did it, and of course, and these people they bring out their leaf blowers to blow oh. the snow. So they're like, it's very loud and irritating. I don't like it, and it's right around this time I realize. So I purposely went and shoveled everything. Still, a guy's out there because he's being paid by some senior to do it. So he's got to pretend to do something. So he's just blowing around. I, I can't see him. But I, anyway, this is real tangent. I'm sorry, everyone. I wanted to go back to something. What were you talking about? Uh, snow? And then, it doesn't snow. matter. Okay, it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. So my point was going to be, uh, oh, yeah, the origin story of this band. So sorry I was on some years ago to talk about this. Uh, Michael, can you, in your own words, and, and maybe it'll contradict everything sorry I've said, uh, many years Likely. ago. Likely. Yeah. yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about the origins of this particular band? How, who's in it? Because it's also interesting. You have people who uh, are in the band and help make the records, but I think they don't always play the shows. Uh, I think one of them is actually a colleague of mine, a Canadian uh, or something, but maybe we'll figure this out. I'm I'm filling in the blanks ahead of time. Michael, tell us about the origins of, of this band. Where did this band come from? Who's in it? Okay. So the band came, started in Brooklyn, New York, uh, probably circa end of 2015. Uh, I was working at a venue at the time called the Bell House, which just happened to be around the corner from a rehearsal space where uh, the Obits practice, which was a band that Saurabh was in with uh, Rick Froberg, Greg Slist, um, uh, Alexis, Alexis, and and well, at the time, uh, our drummer Matthew Schultz was in the band too. So Obits used to come in and have some beers before practice, and I got to know the guys. Saurabh and I realized that we had a connection of playing a show together at South by Southwest, like maybe 20 years earlier in two separate bands. And so uh, we naturally what, what, like struck what, up. Kind of, what were those bands? Sorry. So Rob was in a band called Edsel at the time. I was in an unfortunately named band called Shovelhead out of Omaha, Nebraska. What the hell? Where I grew up. Shovelhead. Yeah. What are the odds I of know, that? All, We've been yeah. talking about shoveling this whole time. It's like we, and it's how, like we planned it. Right? And how it goes to your head. You get all <laughs> in your, your overthink head. about the shoveling. You, yeah. you're a shovelhead. I'm sorry. I might've just given you a I bad was, nickname. Uh, but that no, it's okay. Yeah. It's but it was a little bit self prophetic of yeah, me, yeah. I guess. But um, yeah, so I got to know the guys, and actually, there was after uh, after the so Obits had a few beers one night. The the show was winding down, and we were, they were sitting. I was sitting on the other side of the bar, and Rick Froberg says to me, "He's like, why don't you guys come? Why don't you come over and jam with us?" And I was like, nah, "I'm tired. I don't know." And here I thought to myself, "Here I am telling Rick Froberg that I don't want to jam with him. He's a guy that I've admired as a musician for a long time. I've known Sorab for a long time. I've known Matt for a while, and I think they're all incredible drummers. Although I think Alexis was there at the time." And so, sorry, was Matt? Sorry, was Matt in Obits at some point? I didn't remember that. Yes. Yep. Yep. In fact, he played Sled Island with us the second time we played Sled, Sled Island. It was Matt. And then there was a period of time at the end where we actually had both Matt and Alexis on drums. So we did a couple shows, or at least one show as a as a double drummer. Oh, I didn't know that. Was Matt like a yeah. fill in for Alexis? He was a fill in in Calgary. Um, but we started to write, we actually wrote a whole, there's a whole fourth record that was written with two drummers and vocals, everything done, not vocals. There were some scratch vocals on some stuff. Mm -hmm. It was all stuff that we recorded at our practice base, but oh, we okay. had some, you know, good quality. Like it was a pro tool 16 track recording, but it just, you know, sorry to diverge, but do you think that could see the light of day? I don't know. It would require. It would definitely require some finessing because they're yeah. you know they're practice recordings. So it would it would require a little bit of uh, elbow grease to make it sound like I think what we were hoping they would sound like. Okay, so to, this is towards the end of the band's existence then. 
Yes, yes. Oh, okay. I mean, we literally, it was a whole record huh. that, we, that we wrote and have, you know, what I guess you'd call demos for. Man, I want to, I'm sorry. We can figure this out later, but I want to hear this, <laughs> obviously, as, uh, I as you too. may know, yeah. uh, both of you may know, I'm a big fan of Obits and, uh, uh, and Rick's. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm, yeah, that's something I would clamor to hear, even if it's uh, scrappy. Anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Michael. Uh, you not were at all. Not telling at all. The story. Quite yeah. all right. No, no worries at all. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, ultimately, in a way, I guess you could say Rick Froberg is sort of the spark that got Sh- Shufflehead going because... Shovelhead? Um, no, wait. Uh, Shovelhead. Oh, my God. <laughs> You're all in your head. You're all in your head with the shovel. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's my Rick fault. Froberg is the spark that got Savak going. Yes, and uh, because he invited me to come play with those guys, and then shortly after, I think that was when you guys kind of folded the group, and Sarb and I had you were like, well, let's keep doing something. So oh, that's, nice. That's where it's where yeah. It started. Michael and I were getting together with Matt Schultz, and or I guess you and I were getting together with with uh, Ben Van Dyke, right? Yeah, like right. we basically yes. so Benjamin Van Dyke, who was in a band that actually back together again now, this hardcore band called Silent Majority, a Long mm-hmm. Island hardcore band. He was actually the second grade teacher for my son Asa, and um, huh. he revealed to me that he was a musician and a music fan, and that he he said. Uh, you know, if I show up at one of your shows, I don't want it to be weird. <laughs> and uh, and so we, we we were talking about music a lot, and we said, oh, you know, we should get together and play. And I asked Michael if he wanted to join us, and uh, so the three of us would get together once a week, and then separately, I was getting together with Greg and Alexis from Obits, and then it just seemed great. And then we we added Greg to our thing with Matt, and it just seemed weird not to just put the whole thing together. And so that's when we first started. It was basically Obits was kind of ending and we had these two new small things. We just thought, let's just make it a singular thing. Right. So Savak's initial lineup was basically Obits with Michael? And a, another and drummer. Van Dyke. Yeah. And so we basically had, we had yeah. two sets of songs. One that our first show, actually, half the set Matt played, then half the set Ben played. Right. And Alexis wasn't involved. No, no. Okay, okay. You know, we uh, so some of us uh, on this call knew Rick very well, and some of us knew him a little bit. Bit of a trickster. You think, Sarab, uh, Rick inviting <laughs> Michael over might have been his way of being like, I kind of want to stop doing this, <laughs> but I don't want to leave him in the lurch. Maybe I need to find a someone to fill in. You know, was it? You think he? Was I love doing that, that idea. I don't. I don't. Yeah, I don't think he would have thought idea. it through uh, so so extensively. Yeah. Maybe if there was a whiskey involved, he'd consider it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, but he actually, you know, he gave us the title for our first Savak record. The best of luck in future endeavors was something that Rick said to us when yeah. we were finishing the band, and that uh, so in you know he he's done a bunch of artwork in over the course of the Savak record. So very much an integral part of this band starting and kind of part of the. You know, the DNA of it. That's really odd because uh, you guys might realize this. This show that you're on, named after a Hot Snake song, Creative Control, which was Rick's uh, band. And I often end the show, I quietly, I've never said this to anyone, I paraphrase that Savak title often when I say, nice to be with you, thanks for being here, best of luck in the future. And thank you. Oh, that's and I say it every time. That's cool. And I, it, yeah. it's in my head. It's from that title because I thought it was, it's funny office speak. Kind of yes, like, exactly. like exactly. you know, it's like an email and uh, some. So I, I, I always find it amusing. So that is weird to me. Sorry. Life is weird. Rick well, has been. Yeah, a, it is no, weird. That's you can thank Rick, Rick for that. Too. A, We've, that's, yeah. Rick has been the strange and mystical force in my life for <laughs> as long as I can remember. So. I shouldn't be that surprised. This I see is a beautiful poster over your shoulder. Yeah, I've got a couple of pieces of Rick's uh, frame now, and uh, he would be mad at how he. So the last time he sent me stuff, he he uh, provided framing instructions, and I didn't have the heart to be like, I'm not capable <laughs> of doing that very well. It'll be a mess, and I'll be mad. The thing yeah. is, I try to do things like that, and then I suck at it, and then I'm just I look at it, and I'm like, ah, you screw that up. You got to do it all over again. So I just and I wanted to support a local business, so I paid way too much for the framing. Anyway, yeah, I just got another piece of Rick's, uh, which is actually, ironically, it's called Plenty for All, which is a Hot Snake song as well. And that's mm-hmm. uh, not in, I, in our eye line right now. So Rick, I, I joke that he's a trickster, but I, I view him, he's a mystical figure. I have this piece of this letter, or this note he gave me 
uh, that I think Sorab has seen that uh, oh, yeah. he's making fun of me for living and says, uh, hey, Vish, thanks for helping out the starving artiste. I'd ordered some stuff of his. Hope all is good up there in Ed, uh, Edmonton, which he made fun of me for moving to from Ontario. <laughs> Will I see you again? <laughs> we'll see. Oh, XO man. Rick. So this is always on my desk and wow. uh, it inspires me uh, uh, when I'm feeling low. And yeah, so, uh, a special person. Yeah, and uh, so uh, that's f- interesting. We all have a weird connection in terms of uh, yeah. uh, him kickstarting us to do things. I, I think that's maybe. Yeah, a- and we in fact did uh, dedicate the new record to him as well. Just- yeah, and I was gonna. I, I wondered if maybe he was present in some of the songs, and um, but that's what I always wonder uh, when someone puts out a record after someone has passed. I can't say that I see it or hear it overtly, but maybe we can we can get to that. Um, okay, so sorry. Did I keep cutting you guys off? And uh, and I don't mean to, but it's my nature. You know, this show would be better if I wasn't on it. Don't you feel like it was just the guest yeah, I talking? I feel like there's another show out there that you could really think about yeah. using the format. You know, I'll uh, copy Life of the Record. They seem to know what they're doing. Uh, <laughs> they like. They seem to know my show. They follow me and stuff, and uh, uh, reach out sometimes. So I don't. I don't know who the who's behind it. But anyway. I'm a podcast never pioneer. To it before, apparently, right? did you know that I'm a podcast pioneer? I didn't know that. I didn't. <laughs> I, I would not have known to choose those specific <laughs> words, but I think that thought. <laughs> I'm churning butter and on a carriage, and I'm making podcasts in the forest or something. Anyway, uh, okay. So you you get together, you start playing some shows. Uh, there's some time between. Well, you seem prolific, right? Is the Sorab is the band fairly prolific in its own way? You seem to be putting out a lot of stuff, even though maybe a little bit under the radar yeah. or something. No, I mean, I think for for Michael and me, I think it's we really enjoy each other's company and we enjoy making music together. I think we're sort of a good foil for each other's ideas. And, you know, I think speaking for myself, Michael makes my songs better. And uh, I'd like to think I contribute something to Michael's songs. And so, you know, at our age, I'm 53. I mean, what else am I going to do, really? (laughs) You know, As much time as I can possibly give to doing this, I would like to, as long as it's not compromising my family time and the work that I need to do to try to, you know, pay for my clarified butter, Mm -hmm. my my, my podcast butter (laughs) that you're churning out there in the woods for me. Uh, Clarified butter. You um, turn it into ghee. So I'm a podcast. Exactly. I'm a Hindu. (laughs) I'm an Indian podcast pioneer at this point is what you're saying. Okay, I got it. Yeah. I didn't use those words. (laughs) I'm intuiting. I'm intuiting right now. I'm sorry. You're intuiting. Uh, Rob's face is turning very red right now. (laughs) You're you're inuiting. Uh, 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 (laughs) No. um, So yeah, so I mean, it's, I mean, I guess we would say we're prolific i mean we're not as prolific as like the kinks in 1966 or whatever but but i mean if if we could if we could dedicate more time to it i think we would you know we just try to do it as 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 much as we can because we really enjoy it yeah and i think we're just getting better at it you know i mean i think it's it's like anything the more time you can put into it the the more you sort of learn what your strengths are improve your week you know what all that stuff you know yeah it's interesting i think uh, given maybe your your pedigree some of the people you play with the sound of this band really is uh, remarkable to me. In fact, uh, just this morning, I was uh, my wife and I were driving back from uh, dropping uh, the children off at their school. It's very cold here today. We'd like to walk, but it's very it's like minus thirty or something crazy. Oh, so wow. on those days, we, we we tend to drive them. Anyway, we were driving back. I was listening to your record, and it's been playing in the house for some time. But my wife says uh, this is like a sweet spot for you. This is like uh, Fugazi meets like uh, late eighties REM. I'm like, oh, first of all. I love my wife. She knows me. She knows my sweet spots. <laughs> I was like, yeah, maybe, maybe. I hear a little gang of four sometimes. I hear a little bit of stuff like that. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Michael, you guys, you mentioned how you kind of connected socially and even on a tour route it's in Texas or wherever you, you run into each other. You guys have sort of shared musical touchstones that you've ever discussed or anything like that, the approach you want to make, uh, you want to take with this band? I mean, we definitely have shared musical touchstones, but I do think we come from different places. I mean, literally, you know, coming from, I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, um, which is a much different scene than the DC scene. And the, the Omaha, Nebraska scene that I grew up in was was really fabulous. There were a lot of great bands. There was the, the Saddle Creek label that started when I was, you know, back when I was living there. So I got to actually went to the same high school and grade school as Connor Oberst and the guys from Cursive and in terms of, and Sarab and I both are huge music fans. I've worked at a record store for nearly 10 years of my life. So we, I think we, we both are just, we're fans of all types of music. As far as just, the, I think, 
I don't know, Sarp, have we ever actually really discussed what we want things to sound like or we just kind of no, just I do it, think I think? So. Yeah, in that regard, there's never any sort of specific intention when we start writing stuff. It's more, I think it's a combination of kind of stuff that's already bubbling up inside of us from stuff that we've listened to over the last 40 years. And also, you know, we talk a lot about new things that we're listening to. So, I mean, it doesn't have to be new music specifically, but stuff that is new to us or new to our listening habits. And, you know, we're always sending links back and forth, you know, of, oh, if you heard this record, oh, check this out. This, this song's really great. You know, listen to what the way they do this part, you know. Um, and so I think there's a lot of kind of shared enthusiasm. And even though Omaha and DC had different specific scenes at those times, I think there was a lot of kind of a way of seeing what you were a part of and how that fit into the larger scheme of things that maybe are shared elements. And I think that is probably all around the country and all around the world, you know, I mean, and I think that's the thing about a lot of hardcore and, you know, early like post-punk stuff is that, uh, there, you know, it's very, everything was very regional. And so you had to find ways of, you know, like I remember Edsel played Omaha a bunch. So we were probably in the same room together before we, you know, Shovelhead and Edsel played together. We probably yeah. were both at the Cog Factory in Omaha. And, yeah, um, most definitely. And so, you know, I think there's a lot of things that we do have in common, but we don't we don't specifically say like, hey, let's write this song in the style of blah, blah, blah. You know? Yeah. If anything, no. usually we try, if, we, if something seems too overtly one way, I think one or the other of us tries to undercut it in some way or to give it a little bit more breadth so it's not just that thing because i'm not a big fan of genre music i like music that is expressive expressive of the human experience not of uh not of a specific aisle in the in the uh, in the grocery store yeah or like a genre orthodoxy or something like that right and, yeah 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 <laughs> Hey, thanks for listening to Creative Control, as always. Uh, as you may have heard me mention, I recently lost my day job, and I've had a few conversations with people since who've said, uh, you had a day job? I thought your podcast was your day job. When I explained why it hasn't been my day job to a friend, he suggested I should share some of this information with people like you listening right now. So, in short, unless they have some giant exclusive million-dollar contract, podcasters are not paid to make stuff by companies like Apple and Spotify. Podcasters do not make any money from streaming royalties. Ad revenue is dependent on a certain threshold of downloads each month, and even if your show is accessed 30,000 times a month, the income you get is actually really minimal. So podcasters like me usually make time in our lives to support our communities and our interests to make these shows, and our most reliable source of income for this work is, in fact, crowdfunding. In my case, it's my Patreon. So if you'd like to receive ad-free episodes earlier than everyone else, regular newsletters and blog posts, bonus audio content, and support my work, quite literally, please visit patreon.com slash creative control today. One of the th I asked uh, Michael about a song earlier and, uh, you know, framing it as potentially something political or whatnot, or at least the title made me wonder about this time of people feeling constantly fooled by everything <laughs> and uh, and what that might mean. There seems to be a nice tension between you two in terms of the way you write. I feel like there's a, both of you have this uh, abstract quality. But then I do think things get a little personal or even in jokey. Like, I'm like, I don't think I understand what this means. <laughs> it's probably some joke they have, but it's all very effective. It makes me think. So I just want to ask about that aspect of things in an overarching and potentially reductive sense. Michael, as you ponder these songs uh, of your own, um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about where you feel they may have emanated from. Uh, is it personal relationships primarily or is it kind of universal stuff? Overall, I would say it's universal stuff, although I think with this record in particular, there's a few songs that kind of are coming more from the personal. I think throughout this band, I have politics and sort of world uh, world affairs, if you will, have also been a big influence on me. But with this record in particular, I think in part because I'm just, I've been so burned out on the, the politics and I'm trying to put up my own personal boundaries to yeah. it so I can 
live a normal, sane life. Um, I just sort of went more the personal route, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So it's the circumstances. The context is all the information kind of sucks. Thinking about it, like we have to think of... I have this weird thing where I feel like they try to make all the information suck so we disengage from it and they can just do whatever they want. They, like the nefarious powers <laughs> that be, you know? Uh, but yeah. but then you're like, wait a minute, you're trying to get me off of Twitter. You bought this thing to get me disengaged and, and complacent. Or you're writing these narratives in the press to make me upset and anxious. Uh, I have that, but then I get angry. And I'm like, you know what? I'm doubling down. You're not going to lose me at all. I'm double engaging. I'm triple engaging now. <laughs> you can't fool me. I will not get fooled again. That's how I feel. <laughs> now, do you have a bit of that, Michael, where you're like, uh, you pay attention, but you're also like, you have a filter now. You can't pay that much attention for your own mental health kind of thing. Well, I I'm, I read the news every day. I, I don't watch much television news, but I try to, yeah, I, I can't stop I mean, you're a attention. political science major, right? I was a political science major. I yeah, enjoyed studying the politics. Obviously, it's a huge part of our lives. So I, yeah, I can't not engage. But I think during the COVID years, I had at some point I had to, I saw my wife just like every morning she'd wake up and shove her phone in my face and say, look at this, look at these new numbers or whatever. And I'd be like, I cannot wake up like this every day. It's too much, mm, you know, yeah. but that's different than politics in, in a lot of ways but with politics. I still pay attention. I still am like following like what what's happening in Michigan, like, yeah. you know, which local races, you know, and like Biden's going to lose Michigan this year. That's I was, I was actually talking to this friend on and she was saying that she's like, oh, Biden's going to lose Michigan this year. I'm like, really? And then two days later, the Times come out with uh, these stories that Biden's probably going to lose Michigan because of his support for Israel yeah. and you know, he's not getting much of the young vote and so on and so forth. So um, anyways, yeah, it's hard for me not to be engaged. Do you even think uh, like the word politics? I don't even know what it means anymore in this day and age, given some of the figures who get elected to things. You know, they have no knowledge, really. They're doing it for their, their own self-aggrandizement or like I don't even think there's much ideology in some of them, you know. Sorry, I, this is a real tangent, but when, when we were talking about politics and writing uh, making art about it it just doesn't seem like what it used to be i guess do you relate to what i'm saying well i don't know i the, i i can't help but think that we are sort of forced to mistake what media presents to us yeah. as politics and i don't think that's actually politics i think that is media and i think media is a form that tends to recycle itself i mean for example, I'm here in my dad's apartment and um, there was a time when he would turn on MSNBC and it wouldn't matter at a certain point who the host of the show was. It was there was a single story that day that was just basically being regurgitated over and over again with different special guests, experts about the topic and, you know, variations of the same uh, aerial footage that's cut in. So that to me is media. That's not politics. To me, politics, the thing that is interesting about it is that it's representation of people. And I think the, the, the hard part for me with both how it's presented in the media and how it actually is seemingly playing out is that it's less and less representative of the people. So the politicians no longer really represent what the people want or what they need. They represent special interests. They represent in our country, corporate interests and their own self-interests. And, um, and I mean, if I can not get upset about it, it's an interesting facet of the way the, the, the way human beings work and, and, you know, what motivates Marjorie Taylor Greene? I have no idea. It's yeah. kind of fascinating. Like <laughs> I would kind of like to know because she seems just like a terrible human being to me. Yeah. But then there's part of me that's like, that's just too easy to write her off like that. Like, who is she? Why is she this way? Why, you know, why is Matt Gates who he is? And why have we stopped hearing about the scandal with the underage girls and traveling across uh, yeah. country borders? <laughs> like, like, where's that story, media? Yeah. Please bring it back. I really want to know where, where what happened to that story, you know? Well, I, and again, Michael, just given your, now I'm really seizing on your political science background, which uh, I'm sure you graduated <laughs> a long time ago and you're like, I'm a bit rusty, but, uh, Politics, yeah, I right? I, I, the one thing I will say about the media manipulation part 
is that we end up in these cycles depending on who's in power uh, and who wants to be in power next, uh, where the subtext is everything's broken and only I can fix it. Right. And the media's role of late, and maybe it's been this way longer and I just haven't noticed it, seems to be like, hey, that broken thing, still not fixed. Hey, Congress can't pass anything. Hey, these politicians are feckless. Hey, like this is our major, the failure is the major talking point. Like I uh, still have, we, I don't know if we got it from the library now. I'm not paying much for it, but I have the New York Times app. So I go to their popular stories. I don't want to put a percentage to it, but a good majority of the top stories are about how something didn't work. And yeah. uh, and that seems to be what gets the butts in the seats uh, for every article. Like, oh, I want to read about how something's failing. I want to know more about these polls that suggest this guy's failing and this guy's not doing well. So what I'm saying is a lot of politics, and maybe it's like I say, Michael, I don't know if I'm wrong about this. Is that not what modern day politics is? Is like the promise to fix something that's broken, but the emphasis that it's never getting fixed. Like, what are we supposed to do with it? If I'm right about this or if I'm accurate, what are we supposed to do with this? Can you speak to that? Have I made a salient point of any kind here in what I've just said? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think ultimately people, uh, for whatever reason, a lot of people just like to complain about things. And it's for some for some reason they feel, you know, it, it feels good to complain. And th there aren't too many, you know, solu there, there aren't many solution oriented people out there to use like a biz type term for it. Yeah. Uh, and I think some politicians are. I think that. Obviously, the way between the two political parties, it's so like divided more than it probably ever has been, at least certainly in our lifetimes, too. Uh, and like you said, the media, it's what sells. Like, you know, they, the Matt Gates news cycle about the girls, like that was what sold for, the, for that week or that month or whatever. And now it's what's the next thing, you know? I mean, the I case, suppose like that case was sort of dropped, though, right? That's part yeah, of why it so. went away. Yeah. I mean, I think so. What, whatever the nefarious machinations of why it was dropped, notwithstanding, it was dropped. I feel like we were all kind of watching it, even here in Canada. Uh, maybe <laughs> I'm just I'm an honorary American at this point. I know too much about these things, but <laughs> I want to be an honorary Cana uh, yeah, Canadian. Same. Oh, you are. You absolutely are. <laughs> is Matt Matt Schultz? Is Matt not Canadian? I always forget. Matt lives. No, in New York. he's an Ohioan. Oh, is he American? I guess I associated him with Canada because he played in uh, Holy Fuck and. Right, uh, he's some, the one non-Canadian oh, okay. in the band. Yeah. He's like uh, um, Levon Helm in the band. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, he's he's basically like the Levon Helm of the band. Sorry about that. Yeah, sorry. I know Matt from being around Canadian cities, so I was. I'm like, he must be from the Maritimes or something. I don't know why I thought that. Anyway, sorry. Where was I talking about? Oh yeah, I know a lot about America too much because I consume a lot of media, and uh, yeah, I don't know what it means going forward. Uh, like that, what, that polarization you were alluding to, I think, Michael. Um, yeah. So you're saying, I think, that whatever is in the atmosphere right now, sociopolitically, some of that has seeped into this new record. Is that fair? Uh, yeah, I think it, it's hard for it not to be. It, it definitely informs who who we are as people. Certainly myself, I can't speak for Sarah, but I think it does. And as friends and bandmates, we talk a lot about the world affairs and politics around us. I think it's just a part of who we are as people. So yeah. Whether, Can you know, it may, yeah. yeah, it may not come out. It may not be like an overt nod to anything, but it certainly is there yeah. for us. Yeah. I will, I will actually say that the song Two Lamps is very specifically about the division of not just the uh, political parties in this country, but of how we really stride ourselves as, as societies, even, even as like micro societies. So for example, you know, with the current situation in Palestine in New York, it's a really interesting place to be right now because there are a lot of Jewish people who are saying, as American Jews, we want you to stop what you're doing yeah. in Gaza. Yeah. And it's a very, so it, it, there's this constant creation of this kind of binary view of every situation. And um, I think it's really a very poisonous way to see the world because I think it, it ultimately it, it affects how you just look at the landscape. It's everything has to be either A or B. And I think, Jaws and I were talking about this the other day, like I, I don't think that human beings are binary no. in any form. Yeah. And so the fact that we're pressed to have opinions that are just A or B, and if it's not 
A, then all the B's are wrong. You know, I mean, it really is just a, it's an impossible thing to make people live by with any semblance of reasonable happiness because it just doesn't, it's not reflective of who we are as humans. Yeah. You have a, a great penchant, I think, Saurabh, for addressing um, matters like the one you're describing with humor. I, I think like there's a comical nature to Two Lamps, even in the arrangement. This yes. is a song uh, that I <laughs> I would say reminded me the most of Gang of Four. Um, uh, I don't know if that resonates with either of you, but that's the one where sure. like the guitar is kind of frenetic and yet it's this even paced, almost spoken word uh, presentation of the tune. One of your songs, Saurabh, Let the Sunlight In, mystifies me. 1950, <laughs> the lyrics, if I may recite some of the lyrics to people. 1953. 1961, 1972, 1985. Now that is very confusing to a songwriting processor like myself. Like what the hell? And then it goes on. A cheap motel is where the day begins. I crack the curtain to let the sunlight in. Okay. Painting a picture. I figure out what's going on here. Pack of smokes and a fifth of gin, a list of names and where they've been. Oh, what are we watching? A Coen Brothers movie? What the hell is going on in this movie with this song? I don't know what's going on. Can you talk a little bit about, I mean, feel free to talk about these specific examples if you don't mind. But I, am, yeah. am I right? Like your penchant is for humorous abstraction from time to time. And I, yes, that's, that's a go-to for you. Something has inspired that within you. Yes, because... I mean, even when we started our conversation, you guys were talking about something serious and I had to interject a joke. It's a problem. Right. No, it's <laughs> fine. It's a good problem to have. It's, 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 it's an affliction. It's no, you make for a great uh, <laughs> podcast guest, if I may, because you are you have a levity to you. I appreciate that for what uh, it's worth. Well, so so with, with that song in particular, those, those years, and this actually – speaks exactly to what you were saying. So 1953 is the year that the CIA overthrew Mossadegh, who was the prime minister of Iran. Uh, 1961 is when the head of Savak, who was the secret police in Iran, who everybody despised but were terrified of, he met with Kennedy in D.C. in 61. And then in 72, Nixon and Kissinger visited Tehran. And in 1985, my high school hardcore band released our seven inch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, so what is, you can clearly see the importance uh, of, of all these dates. So what is why did why did it occur to you to highlight these things in this particular song and in such a way? Most people would take those events and try to write about them, and maybe you have here. You just cited the years. That's fascinating. What they're all relevant to that, you in your existence. That part, yeah, it was yeah. that part. The, the 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 relevance was in my head. Right. <laughs> so I just is uh, your birth also, is your birth year somewhere in there? No, it's, okay. it's nineteen seventy. Okay. Uh, but um, the idea behind the song was, uh, it's it's sort of imagine a spy who is aging and his value is sort of in decline. And so his post, he's basically sent off to some far flung place in the, in the near East and kind of left out there to rot. Um, and so he's kind of sending dispatches back and, um, he doesn't know if they're being received at all, let alone being read. Yeah. And I, I like a lot of espionage novels. So the, the, the sort of the joke for me was that instead of the spy who came in from the cold, it was the spy who was left to die in the heat, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. And so, I mean, picturing a guy in a hotel room, he's got a list of names and where these people have been. Um, but he's kind of a dry, you know, he's got their pack of cigarettes and a fifth of gin, you know, so he's, he's done. He's, he's yeah. his, his career is kind of nowhere. Yeah. And then the second verse, it's, you know, left for dead, the desert heat. And then um, I think at the end, it's, you know, every dream is just fear disguised. Every life is just a mark of time. Yeah. That's so very, in other words, it's very poetic, but that resonated with me. Every dream is just fear disguised. Just res I don't know where you got that from, where that came from. But that's that that haunts me a little bit. Oh, uh, thank you. I no. I don't know where it came from either. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a dream. Maybe a dream. Or Somewhere something. between Nixon Kissinger and my high school hardcore band. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah. So no. that 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 your way, I think, Sorab, is what, what I'm getting to is there seems to be a way you have of dealing with serious things from a humorous perspective. Like where is the joke? Or not the jokes. That's the wrong word. Maybe whimsy is the wrong word too. These are dark topics. You have a song, Michael, by the way, called "Paid Disappearance." Uh, and that sounds bad. Uh, that just sounds like dark. But then your delivery is like kind of, 
I don't know, new wavy, Devo esque. Like it's almost sure, a humorous sure. uh, phrasing uh, attack. So there's just what I'm getting at is, I mean, the goddamn the band is named after the secret police in Iran. Is that what you just said? <laughs> there is a yeah. there is a, That's, it's a there's a Canadian reference in there actually. Oh, what's that? Well, so that band uh, Viet Cong. Oh right. Oh right. So they were getting a lot of heat. Yeah. And they changed their name. Yeah. And I thought that was an incredibly lame thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was super weak of them. Yeah. Because, I mean, if you make art, stand up for your art. Yeah. If you choose a name that other people think is bad, tell them why they're wrong. Yeah. But to just change your name, I think is like seriously, it's not reflective to me of a, of a good place to be making expression that I have any interest in. Outsider art. They were getting, um, Canada is a small place and uh, it's a very sensitive place. And we talk a lot. I'm, now I'm just talking about myself. Uh, and uh, <laughs> not all of Canada. I'm not, I don't reflect all of Canada. I think uh, from what I saw, and I, I'm foggy on the details of this, but I think they were really getting enough career-oriented heat. Mm. Like they wouldn't get booked for things. Uh, and they were like, this is just because we named the... B I see what you're saying, Sarab. I'm not... I'm not disputing what you're saying perhaps if savak was more popular we would have <laughs> have a different point of view <laughs> so you're saying you uh, in a re reference to their that controversy and their from i'm putting words in your mouth spinelessness <laughs> you up the ante you yes. chose a similar kind of name i but, thought what could be worse than to name yourself after the hated and feared secret police of iran and has I mean, anyone I, pointed this out or said what are you doing uh, well, we, well, my it's dad, funny. who's yeah. Iranian, thought it was a terrible name. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, yeah. He's like, I yeah. thought Opitz was a bad name. This is worse. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yes, you, it's, you, your humor tends to. You have the what? What do they call? What do the kids say? Gallows humor? Is that how you would describe <laughs> what you uh, engage in? Maybe. Uh, but anyway, I, I just sort of felt like if you can't, if you make art of any kind, and you can't say to people like, "Hey, this is art. This is not. This is like, why does?" the bad thing own the word. Yeah. Yeah. Like we can, we can make Savak a new thing. Savak is our thing. Yeah. You may have this other association and you may come to it with whatever you come to it with, but give me the opportunity to let you know that this is not that this is something else. No, I appreciate that. And I, I like I'm trying to get to, I appreciate that both of you seem to have this earnest streak that you will occasionally spice with jokes. Like even, the new new age is a, to me, a humorous reflection on what we're doing with ourselves, and the technological age. Like, what do you? There's a there are a couple of lines where you. Then we burn the photographs and the photographs of the photographs, and we photograph that for the new new age, and that just. I'm like, oh, that's Instagram. That's all we do on Instagram sometimes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Hey guys, I found this photo of myself from uh, 30 years ago, and I'm going to take a photo of that. Share. That's just a weird. That's just a nice observant. You're like an observational stand-up comedian to me, somehow. <laughs> what every you song that is a very generous, very generous. Every Savak song, for those who haven't heard them, begins with "What's the deal with?" I'm just kidding. Yeah, well, you that's know, I did give, should... give Sorab the name Sorab the Entertainer for a reason. <laughs> Sorab the Entertainer, that's pretty good. So, uh, all this to say, this is a, a sunny and it's an infectious record. Like uh, it gets in my head, and everything we're talking about sounds a little dark. But you guys package them up in these beautiful pop. So if, may I call them pop songs? Does that does that does that sure. seem reasonable? Yeah, that's re okay. It's reasonable. So you have some. I mean, we love we love pop. You know, pop, pop music. I mean, we're not listening to Avril Lavigne or whoever's. I don't know. Levine, <laughs> Levine, Avril Lavigne. Don't Levine. insult Canada. No, I was going to say Avril she's Canadian. Lavigne. She's Canadian. Be careful. I'm so sorry. I'm so, be sorry. Careful. I'm so sorry. No, so sorry. we're sorry too. I just uh, <laughs> yeah. No, she is Canadian. Yeah. But you know, no, I mean, it's not but, like sugary pop, but it's it's it's. it's you mentioned the Kinks. Yeah. Right. Uh, we that love kind the kinks. of edgier edgier pop, I suppose. Or again, my wife heard REM. Fugazi have yeah. pop elements. You know, like it's verse, chorus, verse kind of music. Um, and I think on the new record, there's there's more yeah. sort of early REM in it. We were talking about this the other day. That oh, good. We sort okay. of we we realized to ourselves, we're like, hey, that actually I can I can sort of, you know, people will come up to Michael and say like, oh man, that one song, your vocal totally reminds me of like you know something off a of Reckoning. And yeah, it's yeah. there. I mean, again, not intentionally, but it's there, and it's definitely a part of what 
you know, what we grew up listening to and yeah, our musical DNA. Oddly enough, it took me like four or five months away from the recording of it after having listened to these songs over and over again. And once we started sending it out to people and a couple people made that comment to me, like, oh, it really reminds me of like, you know, early R.E.M., like Reckoning Murmur or whatever. I was like, wow. I'm like, OK, well, that's cool. I love those records. Yeah. You know, I love that band. So, Well, it, it, if I may, some of the guitar sounds and tones recall that kind of chiming Rickenbacker birds rem yep. kind of style so i don't know if you got a rickenbacker in the band but that's what it connotes for me as well so we have a rick and froberger <laughs> you have oh do you have do you have a rick do you have a rick oh it's just a joke i thought maybe you have one of his guitars we do have one of his guitars actually do you play it uh no it needs to be set up it's a great guitar what yeah. is it it's it was made for him um and it has i think great... i saw yeah he would instagram about this he he designed the did he design the pickups or something he chose everything he, I think. he chose everything he designed the body shape and the headstock and uh it's actually it's in um it's in an obits video for i can't remember the song but it's off the it's off bed and bugs oh um, okay cool yeah uh i sorry but as we start to wind down here i alluded to this sorry is rick is his presence felt on this record lyrically in any way from your perspective um well actually I was going to say no, but that's not true. Um, the song Attribution, which is kind of the quietest song on there, that's partially inspired by the Hot Snakes song, If Credit's What Matters, I'll Take Credit. And he, you know, there's that Hot Snakes song, which is great. And then this friend of ours, Ruben Ratting, who's a photographer, um, he's written a lot uh, on his social media about photographers not being credited for their work in this yeah. digital age that we live in. And I really took that to heart and, you know, just started thinking about those themes of what is credit, what is attribution, what is it that we are looking for. And this friend of mine who's a publisher, he actually, he's a Spanish fellow and uh, he does not believe in the concept of authorship. He thinks that stories are universal and at any given time, people just put their names on wherever that story happens to be at that time. But essentially it's a continuum of a story. And um, hmm. I'm not sure if I agree with that or not, but I, it's an it's a it's an idea that I, I was was really thinking about. And so, in the case of this song, we live in this time where people are asked to do work for um, the exposure and all these things. And I, I I do my work as a graphic designer, so there, there's a certain amount of that in my life where people say, "Oh, well, you could do this such and such thing, yeah. and it'd be great exposure for you." And so I just started thinking about the idea of you know. You know, you come to me, you ask for a contribution, but I didn't know it was for my execution. So in other words, like you're, you're asking me to give something to you that's actually killing me. <laughs> mm, yeah. uh, and, um, and in the end, sometimes all you really want, like you don't even, if you can get away with not needing the money, all you really want is just some acknowledgement that you, you contribute, you gave something. Yeah. And uh, so that's, and Rick is, Rick is definitely uh, at the heart of the sentiment of that song. Okay, so it was his own. It was his song, not his passing per se. Correct, correct. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Because Rick uh, passed. No, the, we. Rick, the, the the record was done before Rick passed. Yeah, correct. So, yeah. Or mostly done. I think it was done actually. Yeah, it was done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We actually, he and I were uh, talked about it. He was asking me how electrical was, and yeah. yeah, he was really curious about what the whole thing was like. So yeah, you had um, uh, you had told me. I think you and I had a chat around the time that yeah, he was reconnecting and maybe even thinking about ways you could collaborate again yeah yeah i mean he's yeah. you know he's a, a was a very generous thoughtful and curious person and he was curious about our band and was very supportive and he would always come back with like really interesting like uh sort of comments about stuff i would send him to listen to yeah didn't did you guys not play with hot snakes or drive like jehu or something am i wrong about that I we played a couple shows with the hot snakes yeah, yeah. that's what i thought two, yeah. two or three for shows yeah yeah that's yeah. nice uh, he was a nice yeah i miss him so much so i appreciate uh yeah. talking about yeah. him just a little bit and uh i appreciate this time with you both um i want to get to sort of future plans and then uh where people can learn more about uh uh, how to, uh, you know, follow you and stuff and give you proper attribution for your work and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I relate to this, by the way, as people who've heard the show know, I recently lost my day job and I'm trying to make this a, a viable uh, career uh, more than I ever have. And I feel foolish for waiting 11 years. So like, maybe I should make some money doing this <laughs> podcast. I put a lot of work into it. And some people have said, I thought this was your job. I'm like, no, I've always said, uh, you know, like every musician or most musicians like, yeah, I work. 
so I can pay to do the thing I like. And now I'm like, I, I just want to do this. Anyway, enough about me. I just want to say I wrote. Well, no. I mean, I, I actually, just to that point, I mean, I think your your show is an amazing show. And you've and all the sort of the, the special things that you've done, like you did that great Hot Snakes one, you did the Jehu one. Oh, yeah, the doc. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like the, the, the Albini and Ian, those those two-part things. I mean, you, your interviews are – they're great. We listened to the Tim Midget one actually the other day as we were driving back from playing some shows. Oh, thanks. And, uh, That's nice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I thought that went well. A, I thought that went well actually. Yeah. Yeah. At the, at the end of the at, an, at the end of the interview, we're like, I think Tim pretty much said everything that we would have said if we were. <laughs> but it turns out we didn't actually cover any of the topics. We didn't talk about like condoms or. <laughs> You know, carnality. I'm sorry, guys. Or, I didn't have my Canadian sports. We didn't. We didn't we touch didn't, on Canadian or sports. NFL or you know. We we could go another hour if you want to cover the same topics. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't have notes to talk to you guys about that stuff. I'm sorry. You know, I was checking the analytics and people already dropped off, so we don't need to do that. <laughs> That's right. The numbers. Oh my God, that song that you've got, where it's look at the. Is it? Did I already allude to that song? Uh, where you, you talk about the that. look at the shapes and the numbers? Is that? Uh, yeah, uh, studied your habits. Yeah, that's right. That's, that is that's a weird new, new age, right? That's yeah. the new new age. Yeah. yeah, that's what we're in. Metrics. Sorry, sorry. Have your songs in particular uh, resonate with me? Uh, they have for some time. So I just want to thank you for being a lot like me. That's helpful for me <laughs> as an interviewer. It's great. Minus the shovel, not minus the snow. Yeah, shoveling. exactly. Thank You're you not for... shoveling the way Michael and I like to shovel and then that's go to right. the hospital. That's right. Yeah. Anyway, what was I saying? I want to uh, direct people to uh, learn more about you guys and pick up your album and all that kind of stuff. But let's get to future plans. Uh, Michael and Savak or anywhere else, do you have something brewing, uh, work that you're working on? Uh, well, we just have some touring lined up right now. We're going to uh, do a few dates, I guess, in like two weeks along the East Coast. Then we're going to go to France for a couple weeks in April. And then we're trying to line up more stuff in the fall. The summer is kind of a wash for us because of other everybody's obligations. But I think we're going to try to hopefully go back to the UK in the fall is what we've been talking about. I mean, we're open to anything. We've been talking about going back to the Midwest. We have a lot of friends in Chicago and we were actually talking about going to Canada too, because we've yet to play in Canada as oh. well. So yeah. So, I, but none of those are concrete, but so we're, I guess right now we're just trying to get through the next six months and, and work, look ahead to the fall. Um, if I can help connect you with yeah. Canadian people in Ontario or Alberta, maybe, or elsewhere, it's a small country. I probably could help in other ways, other places. Just let me know. I'm, I'm sure yeah, cool. I can, yeah, awesome. I can try. I mean, I can't promise anything. You know, I can say, Hey, the person you run the thing that I don't run, can you do this? And I'll be like, no, <laughs> I don't have time to do that. What do you mean? I don't know. Or they'll say, yes, of course. I love uh, yeah, Savannah. Sometimes it works. And maybe you know? we can all go to Lanya Vanya. Are they still doing that? They are still doing that. I haven't been... Is since 2017, I think I'm. Uh, I got. Uh, I got shadow banned. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't had me back. That's a whole other podcast. Anyway, they seem to like me, but I don't know. <laughs> haven't had me back. It's fine. I'm not that eager to travel these days myself. It's fine. They know. They hear the show. Anyway, that's good. We'll, we'll try. To, sorry, Michael, I cut you off. In terms of new music, what were you going to say? Uh, so and I have started a new project called Lux Apt. That it started as just like we wanted to do something different than the Savak and. We've done one show as a two-piece. We're just kind of trying to go in a different direction sonically, so to speak, like more sparsely arranged, perhaps more like drum machines, oh. maybe more like synthy type stuff. Uh, and we may, I think, be joining forces with our friend Eli Janney as well, who might be the third member of Lux Apt. And we've talked about spending the summertime, some of the, da some of the down months this summer, trying to write and record that first record. Oh, nice. That's great. You know what? This is all coming back to me. I think so, Reb told me a little bit about this project and uh man i should have made notes for this interview i'm sorry guys i didn't uh, think to ask you about that but that sounds intriguing that's great and there's also a new savak uh split 12 inch coming up with uh, our friends that's been contractions from Lyon, france yes and so that'll be coming out very soon i think while we're over in france in april that'll, that'll come out and different different material than the the from the album nothing from the album yeah it's actually two songs we recorded at the session for the album but the recordings that we did, we weren't happy with our performance. The recordings are good, but the, our performances weren't great. But the demos that we had put together ourselves at our practice space, we realized we actually did really like those. The spirit. So we finished yeah. those. Yeah, yeah, yeah it just happened. You know, 
sometimes just I mean you were talking to Tim about it sometimes Demo, demoitis yeah that's right. Yeah, right this wasn't even demoitis it was just a straight up this sounds better <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> but that's but that's part of the sorry the demoitis thing isn't just that it's better or worse it's like you feel like it's not good enough because it's a demo but the reality that's part of demo demoitis is a multi-stage complicated <laughs> affliction and uh, what I'm we saying we were in stage four <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is it's not simply it's it's just that you can't get over the fact that it's a demo uh, psychologically, right. and even though it's probably better, I've had that. I'm like, this is way better than what we did in the professional place, but we won't put it out for why. I don't understand. Like, this is clearly well, a and actually, when you listen to the podcast with Ian about out of step, he yeah. has a very funny version of that, which is that he agreed. It's actually hilarious. So he agreed with the other guy's minor threat. He was willing to record certain songs, but he never said he was going to put them out. <laughs> and so then it became such it just sounded like they fought all yeah. the time, you know. Such but, an uh, Ian thing. It's, uh, it's, it's language so great. loopholes. So, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Well, I said I'd record. I just never said I'd put it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so we're doing those. Those two songs are going to be on the split with contractions, um, and then. I also play in another band called Vinyls Vi, and that's with James Canty, who was in an earlier version of Savak, oh. and Jeff Sanoff, who has either recorded or mixed almost all the Savak stuff up until the new record, and he and I were in Edsel together. Hmm. And then Eli Janney, who's also now playing with Michael and I in oh, wow. uh, Lux Apt. Uh, I mean, you know, it's just a bunch of friends, basically, you know, it's, you know it's finding excuses to spend time together. It's sort of hilarious um, to me that we're you're invoking all these names because, uh, Michael, you might not know this, but uh, over on the Instagram, I've been trying to pay sort of weekly tribute to Rick uh, since his passing by simply posting any records of his that I have. And uh, so I've been tagging. I'm at the Obit stage. I'm just going to be leaving the Obits phase and it's getting back into... Hot Snakes. Uh, I'm doing it chronologically. Sorry if that didn't make any sense. Oh, oh okay. I've been doing it chronologically from whatever I have from his earliest days to now, and it's been going on since he passed. And uh, anyway, my point is I've been tagging Eli and Jeff because they made a lot of the Obits records. And uh, Eli's name I know. Jeff's name I didn't know as well. And uh, Eli sometimes shares it. Uh, Jeff, not so much. I think he's probably, who the hell is this guy? No, no, me. he's just not on Instagram oh, very much. Okay. No, I'm just, yeah. I'm just yeah. teasing. But it's funny you invoke. Also, those I don't names. think he likes you very much. He doesn't. No. Okay, that's fair. I, 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 I can relate. <laughs> I relate. I relate to him based on my own perception of me. Anyway, I'm sorry. Snow, shlo- snow shoveler and Ed. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, uh, where can people go? Here's the million dollar question: Where can people go to learn about all of these plans and things, Michael? Where would you direct them? Hmm. I guess I would say. I don't know our Bandcamp page. I mean, well, because all the tour dates go up there. But I mean, we, Instagram for us too. Yeah. Sorab mostly manages that account, and we we try to stay pretty active, or Sorab tries to stay pretty active with new nuggets of information. So I would say Instagram is good. But yeah, if you want to listen to the music, or you know, I think Instagram is good, or the, all the tour dates will be up there as well. Bandcamp, you mean? I mean, Bandcamp. Yeah, yeah. Tonight, okay. Yeah. And Sorab, yeah. do you agree? Do you concur? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm actually trying to do more on our website, which is just savakband.com, just because kind of to echo what your conversation was with Tim about the social media landscape. I mean, if we could find a way to get away from all these platforms, I would be delighted and just to have our own thing. I don't think that's realistic for a band of our minuscule size because uh, we just there's not enough people coming to our website. But I'm trying to keep it up to date as best as I can so that hopefully that will end up being the place where people can go. In the meantime. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. In the meantime, Instagram's pretty good. Yeah. And I guess Facebook I do. Too. I'm trying to, you know, because I hyperlink all of the stuff I can, everything you've just said. And I am sort of mindful of what I'm hyperlinking because five years from now, what if these platforms don't exist? Even Bandcamp feels tenuous, right? Like because point, yeah. of the really ownership does. changes and all these things. So I'm like, I try to ask people, like, do you have a website? Some people say they don't. Yeah. yeah. They don't. Yeah. Like, they just don't have their own domain. They're just using, which right now makes sense. Everyone's just using Instagram. as their, And that's the number one social media thing. People, no one says, go to my Twitter. No one says, go to our Facebook page. Yeah. So of the things that we primarily use, it's usually Instagram. But I'm like, there's going to be a reckoning for that at some point, too. Absolutely. Yeah. So, sorry, I'm. why am I doing this weird lecture to you? We all agree. I'm just. I'm just saying, like... <laughs> I'm mindful of the fact that am I going to have to, am I just sharing all these 
soon to be obsolete links. Well, it's actually uh, what's every kind of week. fun about going to websites that are not up to date is clicking on stuff and seeing what shows up. Yeah, <laughs> it like really going back to the old, our old MySpace accounts for the bands that remember when yes. MySpace was like the number one yes. like format for bands. Tumblr, to, or, I mean, or it's whatever just a, Tumblr. Yes, yeah. but those links aren't dead. They're that's not a, dead. That's yeah, a, they're not. That's dead. a key thing. Some of these sites I can see, like we're going through it in journalism right now, where every week there's a periodical saying we're shuttering the website not just you know laying people off we're just shutting it down so like you know in recent times it was vice and noisy and all these people being like what the hell i wrote like 700 things and that's where it's lived so people are like frantically trying to download them onto pdfs like it's just a weird sorry guys just a weird time all this to say savak Band.com, is that what you said? So yeah, SavakBand.com or SavakBand at any of the social media. Actually, okay. we don't do the Twitter one, but the Instagram and Facebook. Yeah. One other quick thing, if I could drop it, just because yes, it's being announced today. I recorded two songs with Ted Leo, Michael Hampton, and Brendan Canty. And oh. uh, the band is called Foreign Correspondence. And yes. uh, they are both songs by a Canadian singer and songwriter named Michael Pagliaro. Oh, nice. That's great. I just had to talk to Brendan yesterday. Oh, really? Actually. Yeah, I had the Aesthetics and uh, James Brandon Lewis talk about their new record uh, they made together. So it was nice to talk to Brendan. And yeah, you, sorry, you got to slow down. You got too many projects. I can't keep track of them all. (laughs) So that is being announced today and that's coming out how? It's a seven inch single and it'll probably come out in April. By the way, that new Aesthetics and James Brandon Lewis song is so good. The whole album is amazing. It's uh, I've only heard this that one song, but it's like a go go song. It's so the good. thing. Is yeah, it the thing yeah, you're yeah, referring yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. Well, James uh, had a particular affinity for go go. Uh, he's a younger fella than all of us, but uh, he was familiar with that. And so, uh, and the fact that he thought Brendan and Joe clearly were, you know, immersed in that just the way Definitely. they play. Yeah, yeah. No, there. It's great, and we had a nice chat. Um, so, yeah. Small world. We all know each other. Yeah. And uh, Saurabh and I are very similar. And that's what we've learned today. <laughs> Basically uh, the same. I think, I, I think yeah. that's great. So if we can go out on a song from this excellent new album, uh, I wonder if, uh, well, let's see. I will, we'll do the thing I always do. I'll ask one of you to pick a song from Flavors of Paradise for us to go out on. And then the other one can dispute the choice. And then we will have a very small debate uh, that could lead to uh, uh, disillusion. It's, it's anything's possible at this point. Uh, I'm going to go to Michael. Michael, can you pick a song from Flavors of Paradise? Absolutely. Yeah. I would like to go out on the song uh, "What Is It Worth" by Savak, oh, written by Sorab. I was going to pick "Up with the Sun," which is a Michael song. <laughs> no, well, you know no, what? No. I'll take. I'll pick one of them for the intro. Actually, "Up with the Sun" is a perfect little sample. Like at the intro, I'll do a little bed track as I'm talking about you guys. And uh, Up With The Sun starts with a nice little roll and it kicks in and you're like, oh, I'm ready to go. This is going to be a great podcast. I hope the host doesn't talk as much as the guest. And then it'll play and then I'll come fade it back up and then we'll be talking. That's what people will hear. So we can go out on. at the end, it's like you'll be like, oh, what is it worth? What is it worth, actually? (laughs) What was my time worth? Uh, Is there a particular reason you chose that song, uh, Michael? Well, I think it's a great song, and it's a song that I don't think, for whatever reason, in the inner circle of the band has gotten as much like uh, like attention that it deserves. I don't know. I just love it. And I love the guitar solos that Saurabh does at the end. Normally, I'm like the guitar solo guy. I play very few guitar solos on this record. Most of them are actually Saurabh, which is oh. kind of a different thing for us. Is and he true? does like this. Yeah, it is true. I mean, I do, yeah. So um, but there's like this really wonderful, like Birdsian sort of guitar uh, arrangement at the end that I totally love. Yeah. So. And Sarab, do you want to tell us anything about what inspired this particular abstract song of yours? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was just, yeah, it's a, it's a song kind of about the the nature of self, you know, the, like the raw animal and versus like the one that's the socially acceptable kind of filtered, processed, polished version. Because, you know, we sort of, I find that we agree to, to adhere to things that at some level our animal selves are fighting against. Um, and, you know, it's sort of survival and reproduction is the animal side, and yet we are continually trying to refine our exterior selves. And I just think that contradiction is kind of fascinating. And 
Yeah, that's what the song is about. And so I guess the question is, what what is this refinement worth? You know, like we all have a certain biology and we all have a certain thing within us. But, you know, on the other hand, like like there's a thing about an anthology of dreams, an encyclopedia of signs. Like we collect all these things. But in the end, is that really who we are or is it just this ephemera? I really appreciate that context. Uh, It's going to make me listen a bit more deeply to the the song, which I characterized as being somewhat abstract based on um, the poetic nature of it. But yeah, this is going to make, yeah, you're giving me something to think about as always. So I appreciate that. (laughs) From the new album, Flavors of Paradise by Savak, uh, this is What Is It Worth? Uh, Michael, Sorab, thank you so much for making time for me and being on the show. I hope you enjoyed yourselves and best of luck. In future endeavors, I hope we talk soon. <laughs> Thank you, Vish. It's been a pleasure, Vish. Thanks so much. That was really fun for for us and for me i think thank you to sorab and michael for being on the show i really enjoyed that check out that new savak record i hope you enjoyed what you heard just now 
And uh, in this case, uh, Michael and uh, Sorab appeared on the 848th episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One Podcast Network and is available just about wherever you get your podcasts. If you can't find an episode that you've heard about and you're looking for it, or if you want to learn more about me and sign up for my monthly newsletter, please visit vishkana.com. There's a link that says follow Vish online, and that is a link tree. So there's a bunch of links in there to follow me on various social media platforms. Uh, if you want to figure out uh, the best podcast player for yourself there, if you're not happy with the one you have, uh, there's links to that in there and uh, the YouTube channel and all sorts of things. So again, follow me online at, uh, by clicking on that link that says follow Vish online. Also, please visit patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation. To keep this podcast going, as you as you may have heard uh, on the show already. Uh, that uh, money is very important to me. <laughs> that is my primary source of income right now. And, uh, you know, I try to give back a little bit uh, uh, the, in the different tiers of the Patreon. So you, you go check it out. You know, at the $4 tier, add free episodes earlier than everybody else. $6 tier, bonus content. $10 tier, you enter uh, the chance to win the monthly prize pack. So uh, that's a, a random draw. So anyway, there's little things to read about in each tier. And otherwise, you're just supporting people like me, and well, me specifically in this case, uh, in doing this show. So I hope you feel compelled to do so. And uh, you know, my wife always says this, you need a benefactor. You need like a, a real... You know, Pete, you need someone who will, like, just, like, step up. I'm like, yeah. So I'll just, and she's like, you should tell people. I'll just do it right now. You know someone who's got, like, a, a lot of money and they invest in the arts and the culture? You know, I know some of you out there probably know someone like that. Maybe they want to be a regular uh, Patreon person or something and, and sort of invest in the show or something. I hate talking like this. You know what I mean. If you know someone like that and they, they're just throwing their money around, and mention my show to them. Maybe that'll help. Again, you can learn more at patreon.com slash creative control. Thanks for listening to me talk about this. I also want to thank independent businesses like Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, Ontario, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton, Ontario for their in-kind support for this show. Thanks, as always, to my dear friend Jim Guthrie, who I should probably call. I haven't talked to him in a while. You can learn more about Jim at jimguthrie.org. And finally, thank you for listening to this episode with Savak. Check out their wonderful new album, and follow that band uh, if you can. And please subscribe to this podcast and follow it too. And tell your friends all about it as well, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. I'll talk to you soon. Bye for now. Bye.